Welcome back. Uh, so we have just had a discussion on the design sizing of the switches for the sample and hold circuitry and we looked into the uh, non agilities associated with the switches, uh, namely the charge injection, clock feed through. Uh, there are some other issues also related to the noise of the switch, um, but here since we are talking about the ADC and the signal is pretty amplified, uh, we may not really consider the uh, noise produced by the channel current over here. So we are ignoring the uh, noise part. So the two critical components that we have discussed is the clock feed through and the channel injection, um, current uh, uh, charge injection. Along with that, we have also seen the size of the concentration based on the leakage current and the on resistance. So these four considerations combined together, the leakage current, the on resistance, the charge injection and clock feed through can give us uh, indications about the sizing. So based on the uh, based on the uh, off resistance, we determine the value of CS which is required to store the data uh, uh, with a good accuracy. Next we looked at the uh, on resistance and uh, confirmed that the sizing ratio for the minimum size ratio for the transistor is good enough to meet the uh, <coughs> minimum possible T on. We said that the T on uh, could have been reduced relatively further uh, as compared to the uh, on duration or the sampling duration, but we chose a, a value of say few microsecond, uh, which is a much smaller fraction of the total time duration, total sampling duration that we have. And then we also uh, try to look into other non realities like the parasitic capacitance resulting in clock fit through and the channel charge injection, uh, which can lead to inaccuracies. And there also we confirmed that a large ratio of CS versus the uh, uh, parasitic capacitances of this MOSFET can be helpful in mitigating these non idealities So, um, now once we have considered this sample and hold unit, we can uh, go further and look into other fundamental building blocks of our um, single slope ADC. The other one that we uh, need to check is the uh, uh, reference voltage RAM that we just discussed. And uh, there uh, we can say that one of the easiest way to produce a reference voltage RAM would be to charge a constant capacitor with a current source. And therefore, uh, if you just have a current source uh, along with a switch uh, which can charge a constant capacitor C um, ref, it can produce a ramp with a constant slope provided this current remains constant. So this is your I. Uh, charge and I can call this switch as um, say S charge whenever this S charge is going on this voltage will be uh, increasing linearly with time also to begin with I need to discharge this I need to set this um, switch to ground and I can call this S uh, reset so when the S reset is getting on this will be discharged to ground and then this can be applied as a reference to our comparator that we discussed this is our um, CS, the sampling capacitor, and we have the switch over here, uh, which is our um, S sample. And here we need to look at the timing waveform for the S switch and SR. When are we going to need them? So, uh, as we discussed earlier, we are going to use a, a narrow pulse for the sampling as compared to the overall sampling duration. And this is your T. Um, sample and this is your T on and as soon as the data is sampled at the falling edge of the T on remember when the T on is getting off the data becomes stationary or stable at the CS and I would like to start my conversion or the ADC operation at that point and therefore it is the right point to uh, put the SCH on so I would like to put my SCH on at this duration and keep it on throughout the entire uh, entire uh, TS minus T on so just before the uh, T on gets activated again I would like to bring it down and this is your S charge and likewise I have the S reset the S reset can coincide with the T on so when the T on is on you can have the S reset um, turn to 0 so that the reference voltage is anyway set to 0 so that, that can be just uh, be coincident with the S reset this is the 
timing waveform that we expect that we'll see how to produce using you know, digital logic. So later when we go towards the component, uh, digital components, the counters and the control logic, we can see uh, the mechanisms through which we can generate this using a single global clock. So in general, the entire system you will have just one clock, and using that you may have to generate the appropriate control signals for everything else. So we'll look into that a little later. Right now, I'm just saying that the waveforms available. So in the simulations, you will be just required to construct these waveforms using ideal switches. Sorry, the ideal voltage sources, pulse sources with certain uh, T on T off ratio and certain frequencies suitable to get these waveforms. Now, uh, here once again we have. Uh, discuss two components, two critical components that is the current source and the um, capacitor over here whose choice is going to determine my uh, overall charging behavior and uh, once again we expect this minimum and maximum voltage over C ref to be close to zero and BDD respectively because our input voltage is also having corresponding range and therefore uh, the ICH over here can uh, we can say I is equal to C dB by dt where you have uh, the delta V because this is going to be uh, almost a constant slope and therefore I can just replace this dV by dV by delta V by delta T and this delta V is going to be VDD almost in our case 2 volts and the delta T corresponds to the entire charging duration if I assume that this is almost same as TS uh, because I can ignore this T on I can uh, take the TS as uh, I guess 0.5 millisecond that we uh, use in the beginning so I can take this as point 5 millisecond as a result I have C times 2 upon 0.5 uh, millisecond coming over here and once again uh, I would like my C value over here to be sufficiently larger than the parasitic components parasitic capacitances of the switches and the amplifier because remember parasitic capacitances um, can change with the voltage so if the voltage is changing over here the parasitic values uh, especially CGD, CGS um, and they can change uh, as the voltage changes and as a result the uh, the rise will become non-linear with time I don't want that so I would like the C ref to be sufficiently large as compared to the, all the parasitic capacitances coming at this node and uh, once again if I look at the comparators in the switches even if they are using minimum size transistors at least we will have say a few femtofarads or few tens of femtofarads of capacitances coming over here because of the input devices and therefore it, uh, to, to a safe limit I can choose this C ref to be say at least one picofarad so let us uh, check whether if I, if I choose the CRF to be 1 picofarad which is sufficiently higher than all the parasitic capacitances of these inverters I will be getting uh, uh, I value which is uh, pretty small if I look at this 10 to the power of minus uh, 9 and uh, as a result the required I value can see it is going to be you know pretty small uh, as per uh, the required uh, conditions over here and um, if, if I look at say uh, so in terms of order of magnitude you are having just 10 to the power of minus 8 coming over here which is just 0 0.01 micro uh, ampere so now uh, producing such small values of I definitely it is feasible on chip if I try to see it is definitely feasible to produce such low values of I um, however the precision uh, in order to maintain the precision for such large or low value of I you can you will have to do a lot of um, uh, you may have to choose appropriate topologies for the current generation source and the current mirror so that uh, for such low values a few tens of nano amperes the current precision is maintained um, and uh, if we want to have better precision and more robustness we may like to go for relatively larger uh, charge current over here so um, a few tens of nano amperes or 10 nano ampere may not be a good number because that is uh, going to have a lot of uh, variation over process and temperature so remember for this kind of current the transistors implementing the channel uh, the ICH will be operating in sub threshold regime and uh, with process and temperature there will be a lot of variations and it will require a lot of calibration so that this is within the uh, within a given accuracy so generally when we use this kind of uh, very sub threshold current sources uh, there can be some mechanism through which we can calibrate them and even after the fabrication we can set them close to the desired value but uh, the control becomes more and more challenging if they are operating in deep sub threshold regime therefore that may mandate a larger value of C over here uh, so if at least if you want to have 100 nano ampere so that you have a 0.1 micro ampere of current uh, we can see that uh, will require at least say uh, 
10 20 picofarad of capacitance over here so if i choose say 2.5 uh, 25 picofarad of capacitance that will lead to around 0.5 uh, 0.1 uh, micro ampere of current which is relatively safer uh, up to 100 nano ampere of current it is relatively safer once you go below 100 nano ampere or 0.1 micro ampere uh, it becomes more challenging to maintain these currents um, um, to a good precision so i will select uh, c say 20 picofarad which can be of course quite area hungry it will take a lot of area if i have 20 picofarad remember in the front end amplifier once again we had um, limited our capacitances to um, uh, 10 picofarad and lower but again once again here in the adc the robustness requirement the requirement to keep these um, um, current sufficiently robust over process and temperature we are forced to have a c value which is larger of course another uh, uh, constraint is also coming from the uh, delta t or the sampling frequency if you are trying to have sampling frequency which is faster uh, that is uh, uh, also or if you are going to have the um, sampling frequency which is uh, smaller that is also going to you know require a smaller delta t because the charging rate is correspondingly smaller ultimately you have to have transition from 0 to vdd so if you are trying to save power once again uh, you can see that uh, the area is going to increase so there are always trade offs so power and area power and precision and so on so if i assume if i try to save power by curtailing my signal to further lower frequency rather than 1 kilohertz if i try to curtail it to few hundreds of hertz by using a low pass filter so in that case probably i will be able to use a, uh, a small uh, i'll be able to use a um, larger um, uh, i'll be able to use a, a larger uh, t over here i'm sorry uh, so if, if i'm uh, trying to uh, use a larger um, signal frequency uh, or if, if I'm, doing, I'm trying to use a smaller um, delta t over here then of course for a given VDD uh, the i required also you know, goes up further and therefore the uh, once again the power consumption in this particular branch is uh, going to go up um, but but in general that power consumption in this branch may not be so critical because we have seen that the power consumption in the front end amplifiers etc are mm, sufficiently larger at least few tens of micro ampere whereas here you have uh, we are limiting this current or this, uh, we are cu limiting this current to few hundreds of nano ampere or one micro ampere therefore that that's not an uh, important constraint however area uh, definitely is a more serious constraint over here because uh, 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 capacitor values of um, larger than 1 picofarad the area becomes pretty large for a 40 nanome, uh, 180 nanometer CMOS technology the uh, area density of this capacitor may be just up to say few tens of uh, around 10 femtofarad per micrometer square so uh, one uh, picofarad that means you are having 100 uh, micrometer square this is 10 micro cross 10 micro and uh, if you are having say such a large value of uh, 20 picofarad you can assume correspondingly large area so the C values uh, take a huge amount of area as compared to all of the transistors etc the area uh, becomes an important constraint so uh, so this is this is regarding this the choice of the you know um, ich and the cref so this is just one point that we have addressed now we also need to look at the choice of the uh, bias current uh, or rather the ramp current ch and also the um, switches over here now here of course switches are going to be much less critical because uh, they are just supposed to discharge the current to ground and here it is supposed to just pass the current uh, provided by ch to the capacitor and therefore i can afford to have the switches to have minimum size um, and also um, uh, also we uh, um, we need not worry about the voltage drop across the switches if even if there are minimum size and the uh, uh, are on of the switches is suppose uh, say 10 kilo ohm as we just discussed here we are looking at the current which is uh, maybe a fraction of micro ampere 10 to the power of minus uh, 7 or something as a result the voltage drop across the switches will be very small means even, even they are in triode region and fully on uh, though we are having 10 to the power of 4 times to the power of uh, minus uh, 7 so less than millivolt drop across the switches when they are fully on so uh, we should uh, we would not expect significant drop across the switches as a result uh, we can use minimum size transistors without worrying about the voltage headroom over here likewise uh, 
uh, here of course it is just supposed to discharge this current so here headroom is not at all important but uh, here of course we are trying to connect this current source with the help of the switch to this point and we know that the current sources we need certain minimum voltage headroom uh, however uh, and therefore the switch should not eat up th that headroom but remember the digital switches we are just acting like switches and turning on and off they can operate in deep triode region uh, when they are on and their voltage drop is very insignificant as compared to the voltage headroom of the current source. Therefore, we do not worry about the headroom of the switches. Another point regarding the price of transistors. So, here we are uh, trying to discharge the capacitor voltage to ground and we know that the NMOS is a good candidate for that. So, I can just use an NMOS, I do not need a TG over here. Likewise, this current is supposed to charge this voltage to the maximum possible value VDD from 0 and therefore, we know that PMOS is a good candidate for this one because PMOS can easily charge uh, uh, the capacitive node to VDD. So, I can use the PMOS comfortably over here without uh, worrying uh, about putting a TG. So, we do not need a TG for either of these two transistors. Now, let us talk about the ICH that we are trying to implement and uh, remember the constraint for ICH is that we try to keep it as constant as possible even if this voltage is changing significantly we should not uh, allow ICH to change significantly we should keep the um, ICH versus this V ref almost flat um, in order to ensure good accuracy and for that once again uh, we would like to use cascode current mirror and if you use cascode current mirror remember for a cascode current mirror uh, as we have seen earlier in our discussions, the uh, minimum headroom required is to be overdrive provided you use the reduced um, headroom cascode or wide swing cascode that we have discussed in the class. Uh, so, uh, we can use a reduced um, headroom cascode that we have uh, discussed in one of our earlier sessions to implement this ICH uh, and there also uh, we can make sure that the headroom consumed by that uh, transistor is sufficiently small by uh, using appropriate W by L of the transistor. So, if you remember the discussion we can have our reduced swing transistor this reduced uh, headroom transistor where you are having uh, I ref injected into the PMOS and uh, you are having the same I ref injected over here and with the help of this you can bias the cascode current source. This becomes my current source where I am uh, providing the ICH. So, you have the of course, the switch connected over here. So, this is your uh, switch and this is forming, forming the output branch and here we know that the maximum voltage this can handle is almost going to be 2 V over drive where V over drive is V s g minus mod V t of these two transistors and if you size these transistors large enough V over drive can be made sufficiently small uh, maybe few tens of millivolt and uh, we can also make sure that the output um, the maximum output over here which is supposed to match to the maximum output available from the amplifier which is again VDD minus V over drive of the previous stage. We can make sure that this uh, limit uh, VDD minus 2 V over drive over here V V D of 2 over drive over here is matching with the maximum voltage that I am expecting at the input by appropriately sizing these two transistors by having sufficient W by L. So, that the V over drive is minimized there are two constraints I need a minimum L so that the RO is sufficient so that the slope remains sufficiently flat. If you use very small channel length despite having cascode you may not get a very flat curve therefore, you need a minimum channel length so that the curve is sufficiently flat and also you would like to need the uh, like to have the W sufficiently large so that the overdrive voltage is small so that I can uh, we can have uh, maximum possible voltages over here without pushing this transistor into triode and hence without uh, deviating this current from the uh, required ICH. So, uh, the L determined by the uh, uh, flatness of the I D V D S curve and the W is determined by the overdrive voltage. So, first choose the L to get a uh, very flat curve for the I D V D S or in this case I would say I out I G H versus the uh, v, uh, v ref. So, this should remain as flat as possible uh, if V ref is reducing uh, VDF is increasing we know that VSD will reduce. So, you know because of channel length modulation you can get some slope. Uh, however, you have to keep the channel length sufficiently large so that uh, the slope is minimum and then at the same time you have to keep the W sufficiently large so that the overdrive voltage is reduced. <coughs> so, now if uh, now we have discussed the 
uh, second um, critical module for the overall design which is our um, ramp circuit for charging the capacitor. We looked into the design or choice of the C ref and the I, ch uh, I charge. We uh, look at the trade off that okay, despite numerical value giving us a uh, very small I, we should not go for that and rather choose sufficiently large ICH so that it is robust enough, it is more tolerant towards process and temperature variations. And uh, also, we looked into the considerations for the uh, ICH um, in order to make it um, sufficiently constant and in order to ensure that the slope is remaining relatively flatter. Now, uh, the remaining discussion is on uh, the most critical block, which is namely your comparator, where we are going to look into the comparator design for uh, the overall operation. We are going to look into the um, design issues associated with uh, single comparator operation. Also going to look at the non ideality associated with the comparator, which can hamper your overall operation uh, or at least reduce the um, accuracy of your um, digitization and trying to propose solutions to that. Um, along with that, we will look at architecture level, how to uh, resolve some of the issues or limitations faced by a single comparator by combining multiple of those and uh, meeting the overall specs in terms of input range, because one of the most important uh, design consideration for this um, uh, for this ADC is the input range. We need to make uh, full swing at the input. We need to meet the entire rail to rail swing at the input and for that again we need have another constraint coming into picture. Um, so, that we will see that that gives rise to another difficulty and uh, in order to meet the, the input swing if you are trying to make some architectural modification, trying to add other, other modules to make the uh, input range large, we will see that other compared to non identities like offset and mismatch can uh, create further difficulties and we may need to address those issues um, by having uh, appropriate uh, mechanisms to cancel out the non identities. So, let us uh, look into the comparator design and trying to look into the um, transistor level implementation, the issues associated with the choice of the topology, the uh, number of stages, the sizing and along with that the non identities like offset. Before we uh, look into the comparator design, it will also be uh, useful to check out the uh, check out the specification of the comparator that we would like to uh, use, so that we can um, have some idea about the uh, design parameters of the uh, comparator and look at the practical number that we can have for the target comparator. So, if I look at uh, the operation once again, I am supposed to have. Uh, T s the sampling duration that I have chosen is around 0.5 millisecond in this example. And uh, as I have said the comparator is supposed to uh, compare the ramping V ref with the sampled input signal. And uh, there are two important specs for the comparator that we would uh, need is the gain and the bandwidth of the comparator. So, for a comparator we can use the same two stage amplifier that we have been using for the front end application as well as for the filter design and so on. Um, however, we need to look into the overall specifications in terms of gain bandwidth. So, let us let us first uh, talk about the uh, required gain of the comparator that we are going to use. So, once again if I uh, talk about this entire duration where uh, we are uh, first of all dividing the entire signal level into 15 millivolt uh, segments and then we are trying to uh, map it into this uh, duration of 0.5 millisecond. Uh, remember that the uh, on duration of the comparator that is uh, as long as the comparator is high that means, uh, you are having the capacitor the uh, reference capacitor being charged and uh, the on duration or the high duration of the comparator determines the magnitude of the signal. So, if that uh, if the uh, V ref reaches the input signal quicker that means of course, the input signal is smaller um, and vice versa. And of course, that also implies uh, that if you are having uh, a, uh, a smaller input signal that would that would uh, that that would uh, uh, that, that would imply that the reference signal or uh, is reaching the input quicker and uh, you are having the uh, compared output going down faster or earlier. Now, if I uh, look at the, uh, the first metric that is the uh, gain of the comparator. For that we can uh, arrive at the gain in several different ways. If I look at the analogy for the 
uh, energy for the uh, ramping circuit that we are looking at there the suck there the voltage is going to increase at different time steps continuously now how many time steps do we want in this interval so that we can have the number of quantization levels over here equal to the number of quantization we want in the adc so we know that the adc quantization we have chosen is say 7 bit and therefore we are looking for you know uh, 127 different levels and therefore uh, we are having uh, the overall voltage signal divided into 127 different segments. Therefore, of course, if you have to measure the entire uh, signal in terms of time duration uh, in this entire 0.5 millisecond, I would like to divide this into correspondingly uh, 127 uh, uh, segments. And uh, as a result, uh, if I look at the uh, counter which is supposed to uh, uh, supposed to give me the count of uh, or supposed to give me the magnitude of this duration and hence the magnitude of the input signal that is supposed to be driven by certain clock frequency corresponding to uh, this time division. So, here I would like to have my overall signal or overall uh, sampling frequency which is 10 kilo 2 kilohertz chosen uh, corresponding to that I would like to have the frequency of the clock given by um, 127 times 2 kilohertz or so close to 250 uh, kilohertz. So, this is going to be my uh, clock frequency which is required to give me so many different levels in the time domain corresponding to the required number of levels in the amplitude domain. Uh, so, I approximately I can take it as 25 kilohertz a uh, comfortable number and now uh, if I look at if I look at the comparator uh, bandwidth and the gain required to uh, uh, satisfy this 25 kilohertz bandwidth for the clock. So, one uh, important factor would be the speed of the comparator, how fast the comparator should operate and for that we need to look at the behavior of the comparator between uh, uh, the clock pulses uh, at which it is having a transition. So, suppose the comparator is having a transition at this particular uh, positive phase of the clock um, and uh, therefore, uh, we would imp this would imply that just before this positive edge the reference signal was equal to uh, v in minus uh, maybe a small value delta and just after this particular instance the reference signal has gone up to v in plus delta 1 and uh, provide this delta 1 uh, or you know delta 2 provide this delta 1 and delta 2 are sufficiently large that would imply that uh, just at this instance the competitor should start to change uh, its output from VDD to ground and uh, before the next clock pulse arrive the competitor should be able to make the entire transition. That means, if uh, if I zoom out this region if I say that there is this is the uh, clock which is uh, driving the counter. So, before the next clock pulse come that means, because the count gets incremented by uh, 1 the competitor should be able to change its state. So, from this particular rising edge to the next rising edge the competitor should be able to uh, change its output state and settle to the low value and therefore, I would like to make sure that the settling time of the comparator is definitely uh, lower than the uh, period of the clock over here. So, here I would like to make sure that the settling time which is given by the uh, uh, 3 dB cutoff frequency of the comparator or the amplifier which is being used to uh, uh, use as a comparator. I would like the 3 dB cutoff frequency to be uh, sufficiently higher than the uh, clock frequency that we are using over here. Remember, if you are having an open loop amplifier which you are using as a comparator with the transfer function A0 upon 1 plus S upon uh, P, its overall time domain response will be given uh, by the exponential factor to power minus T upon tau P, where tau P is 1 upon P. And uh, in order to make that time constant uh, sufficiently smaller than this time period, so that the comparator can respond fast within this one period, I would like to make sure that the pole frequency of the amplifier that you are using is sufficiently higher than this 25 kilohertz. A uh, good margin would be 4x, so we can uh, keep the amplifier bandwidth or target the amplifier bandwidth um, to be at least you know 4 times 25 kilohertz, so let us keep it uh, 100 kilohertz. We can be more aggressive and try even larger values, but for the time being we can stick to um, say 100 kilohertz. <coughs> now, this is the one uh, quantity that is known. Now, another quantity that also needs to be figured out is the gain of the um, comparator. 
and for that once again we can look at uh, it in from different angles one of the possibility is to look at the ramping behavior of the vref and uh, at uh, if i look at the uh, different clock pulses so suppose the clock is going on and this is the nth period of the clock and this is the nth plus oneth period of the clock so of course at this point the count is going to increment from n to n plus 1 and uh, suppose the vref is uh, the v in is um, approaching the vref so this is your vref which is ramping up and this is the v in which is sampled so the point where vref equals to v in is the place where i have to stop the counter so if the vref approaches v in just um, at the nth count just before the nth count um, the counter may miss this uh, uh, falling edge of the comparator because at this point ideally the comparator will go down but of course the comparator has some uh, finite delay and the the control loop which is supposed to set the counter off uh, is also having some finite delay so it may end up missing this uh, transition but definitely before the uh, next transition I would like to make sure that the counter uh, is able to uh, the comparator is able to uh, switch completely to ground and uh, therefore uh, the uh, by the time the signal is reaching or being incremented by this delta v which is given by the step voltage change between this time interval we would like to make sure that the comparator is completely able to switch from say vd to ground um, and if i assume that this delta v is of course corresponding to the uh, interval or the segment that we just figured out remember you have the total number of segments over here which is n which is equal to the total number of segments in the amplitude domain so if i assume that this delta v is uh, the same as whatever uh, delta v we use as a segment over here which is 15 millivolt we would say that within this single uh, uh, within this single clock period uh, the overall increment over here will also be close to delta v because it is starting from zero going all the way to vdd and uh, for this delta v duration we should make sure that the comparator is uh, transiting from VD to ground. So to an approximation we can say that um, if this is the limit, this is the minimum signal for which the comparator is having or uh, having a transition from the minimum voltage level that is zero going all the way to VDD or vice versa. So this is output swing corresponding to delta V. So to some approximation I can say that the open loop gain of the comparator uh, A naught should be greater than this uh, full swing which is zero to VDD uh, divided by delta V and uh, in this case if i have uh, vdd which is say uh, 2 volt and delta v say uh, 15 millivolt uh, we can uh, have we can uh, see the required gain as uh, say uh, 20 upon 15 um, so basically um, 4 by 3 uh, times 100 and once again if i look at the margin we would like to have the gain uh, say sufficiently large so that because of process and uh, temperature variations if the open loop gain is going down uh, we can have enough margin so i would like to make the uh, actual open loop gain in the design at least sufficiently larger than this number so that because of worst case process and temperature variations if this number uh, goes down as compared to the expected design value i have enough margin so rather than 100 i can uh, keep uh, some margin at least to say uh, few hundreds or at least say uh, we can pick a number say uh, 400 at least four times larger than this so let us choose again which is say uh, 400 which is uh, sufficiently larger if we want to be more aggressive we can go for even larger gain at least say 10 power of 3 so that we have uh, a very good margin and even in the worst case temperature and process variation we are having enough room over here uh, remember the gm ro product of the amplifier they are very much temperature process dependent so we would not like this uh, again to drop below the required value so let us keep the value 400 and therefore we would have a gain bandwidth product which is uh, going to be 4 uh, mega so you're having um, 400 times 10 to the power of uh, 5 over here so we can see the gain bandwidth product uh, is going to be uh, 40 mega 40 mega hertz for this particular uh, case so remember this gain bandwidth product is sufficiently higher as compared to what we used for the front end amplifier which was just around 1 gigahertz <coughs> Um, so here, of course, the required gain, open loop gain is lower. We are just having 400, which is much lower than 10 to the power of 4 that we targeted for the front end amplifier. Uh, but the bandwidth required is also uh, relatively higher, uh, just so that it can uh, operate with this high frequency clock or it can respond faster as compared to this clock. That is giving us the upper, uh, the, the lower constraint of the frequency. So we have the requirement for the gain and uh, bandwidth for this um, uh, comparator.
Now once we have the specs, we can go ahead and try to look at the transistor level implementation and the associated issues for this comparator. Any any question? So let us let us uh, look at the uh, comparator design, which can meet these specs. The gain that we have over here, as we have mentioned, it's not very significant. Uh, in the earlier designs, you might have seen that a uh, few hundreds of uh, gain can be obtained from a single stage. So we may think that, okay, a single stage comparator may be able to do it. But let us look at the issues and try to understand um, why still we may have two stage preferable just in order to keep the design robust enough. Sir, uh, if the sampling frequency is 2 kilohertz, then the bandwidth of the computer should be 1 megahertz. Mm -hmm. Like 250 kilohertz. That should be 250 kilohertz. Oh, sorry. 50 kilohertz. Uh, sorry for the error. So here it will be uh, bandwidth is going to be four times as to one megahertz, and that would just uh, push this up. So I'm sorry for that. I'll have a 4,000 gain. That is because I have chosen the initial frequency to be slightly higher. If you look at the discussions earlier, we had. Uh, we restricted our signal frequency to our 100 hertz, but here I have intentionally taken it higher, maybe 1 kilohertz, uh, just to make sure that the design is a little more, more aggressive. Neural potentials can have signal content up to kilohertz, so that is a relatively upper limit. But still, I have you know taken that uh, uh, in order to have a more aggressive limit for the uh, in order. So that will just uh, push my in order up. So now it thinks yes, if I if I um, stick to the larger bandwidth requirement, say. Uh, at least one kilohertz for the signal. Uh, then, of course, it seems like. So, why gain is increased? Uh, I guess you have the bandwidth uh, you know, 10 power of 3, and you are having the uh, overall. Uh, this is 1 mega, and you have the uh, gain which was you know, 400. And that was also because uh, we are having the um, overall uh, factor that I said is around 100, but I just took an. You know, um, the overall voltage, the peak to peak voltage that you have two, and we have seen that the um, delta V that we are expecting is around uh, 15 millivolt. So as a result, we are having uh, something like 100 times uh, some integer. So we are trying to gain the gain which is sufficiently large. So uh, if I sorry, if I look at the gain, I have taken it as 400. So gain bandwidth product, if I say this is uh, rather than um, 40, this is 400 megahertz. So I have uh, the gain bandwidth product given by you know, 400 megahertz, which can be definitely challenging enough. So you are having a overall gain bandwidth product which is uh, 400. So I, I sorry. So I was basically sticking to the um, earlier bandwidth. So here intentionally I have uh, uh, increased the bandwidth uh, from say hundreds to uh, kilohertz. So in our earlier discussion, uh, the bandwidth of the signal was maintained within 100, uh, but just to ensure that uh, the higher frequency content are not lost, I have intentionally increased the signal content or uh, the target bandwidth of the system to be at least one kilohertz, um, and that would mandate a larger bandwidth. Now, if I if I had taken uh, a more relaxed stance in, the, in terms of say signal bandwidth, that it okay means let the LPF or the low pass filter reject the content beyond 100 hertz. So that my DSP can do the required computation within 100 hertz of signal and give us the required information. That would rela that would have much relaxed content over here. So in that case, the bandwidth would be you know uh, just 100 kilohertz, and the gain value product would be 40 megahertz. Still, uh, you know, relatively relaxed. But now, if I'm targeting uh, higher frequency content in the signal, also of course it translates to uh, trade-off over here. We are having a much higher uh, bandwidth requirement and also the open loop gain requirement. So we can see that if you're trying to extract more information from the data and trying to have you know, larger frequency content in the data, uh, you are paying the cost in the analog domain. You are having uh, to put more gain for the comparators and also the, uh, the digital part, which is the clock and the control unit. They are going to have become more power hungry. So just like in the analog domain, um, if you're having higher frequency content or allowing till one kilohertz, uh, remember, there also you may have to use relatively higher chopping frequency for instance because uh, you need to shift the uh, frequency further higher as compared to the corner frequency. Corner frequency may be 100 hertz but now you need to shift the, uh, the signal frequency sufficiently higher at least few kilohertz. So that would also of course lead to uh, increasing power in the 
uh, front end stages but uh, uh, along with that if I look at say uh, even the filter stages um, where you are having the anti chop data which has been down converted to the original frequency and you are targeting say at least uh, say up to kilohertz so all the uh, stages including the VGA and the filter they will have to process that frequency content so analog power of course goes up here uh, if I talk about the ADC there we are seeing that if you are allowing larger frequency content in the signal the overall um, gain requirement and the bandwidth requirement also goes up and hence we are having uh, more stringent content on the gain bandwidth now here if I take up uh, say uh, A naught of, of 400 there also uh, still we have the same argument holding true we have almost say a single stage uh, uh, which can achieve this gain um, but along with that you have the you know, bandwidth requirement for which uh, you may have to restrict your uh, overall RO values and hence burn sufficiently uh, bias current sufficiently high bias current as well to achieve this kind of bandwidth uh, and hence the gain bandwidth product of 400 megahertz. So yes, CMOS technology if I look at the gain bandwidth product 180 nanometer can achieve gain bandwidth products close to few gigahertz uh, easily and therefore this is pretty much within limit but definitely it is on the higher side and it may mandate larger bias current in the comparator and hence increase your power dissipation on the comparator. So the design of the comparator therefore will become a lot more challenging and uh, uh, we need to uh, make sure that uh, within a given power budget we are able to uh, ensure the comparator operation and uh, we will also see that if we look into other non idealities of the comparator like uh, mismatch and offset it may further aggravate the requirement of the bandwidth so that that uh, will come to it uh, very soon okay so um, let us uh, try to look into the comparator design and try to resolve this issue of single stage but this is two stage and uh, uh, see what are the uh, pros and cons of using just single stage to obtain this 400. Along with that, of course, you have a you know, bandwidth requirement which is also you know, uh, sufficiently large. So you are talking at talking about at least uh, uh, a bandwidth which is you know pretty large, which is close to say uh, one uh, gigahertz, and which is also very much achievable but it is going to burn a good amount of power in the comparator. So the time delay that you are looking at for the comparator in this case will be pretty large, oh, sorry pretty uh, small. So let us uh, get back to our comparator circuit where we are going to use our open loop amplifier and And remember, uh, for the comparator operation, uh, ideally we do not worry about the um, biasing point of the output uh, voltage over here. Uh, and we are, uh, for the two stage op amp, of course, we have certain constraint. If I use this as an op amp, we need to make sure that this is at a proper bias point. And uh, that, in fact, makes, uh, uh, the, in the feedback configuration, of course, the negative feedback of the amplifier makes sure that this is operating uh, to that bias point. Uh, but for open loop conditions, once again, uh, we don't have much control over the single ended output. The differential amplifier or fully differential amplifier, we have taken help of the common mode feedback to step the output to that point. Here, that is also not feasible because there is a single ended output and we cannot really take a common mode feedback to stabilize this. Um, if we do take a single ended approach and try to you know, figure out uh, uh, something like the single ended version of the common mode feedback circuit, it would require a very large RC time constant for just providing uh, our uh, low pass filter and uh, extracting only the DC component from here. In the differential half, you have the common mode extractor which is automatically extracting only the common mode DC value or low value common mode value. But here if I try to extract the DC value just for establishing a bias point, it will require a very large uh, you know, RNC value or filter uh, values to implement such a uh, common mode feedback or a DC feedback, I should not call it a common mode feedback, but a uh, DC feedback to stabilize this to required value. So therefore for single ended version generally it is not very feasible to obtain a, a well defined DC point in the open loop amplifier, 
uh, if you're looking at integrated circuit because those kind of very large RC values will not be feasible to extract the DC potential and then put a you know, feedback to the amplifier. Therefore, for integrated circuit, we don't have a uh, well-defined DC point over here. But for comparator operation, we do not worry about the exact DC point because it can go all the way to BDD and ground in normal operation. Remember, however, in order to obtain the you know, frequency response when you're trying to judge your uh, amplifier for uh, meeting the required gain um, bandwidth uh, constraint, you need to use appropriate DC bias point so that you can take the frequency response. Frequency response, remember, it is a linear analysis where uh, the simulator uses linear model, the small signal model of the amplifier. Um, and uh, the small signal model means that the amplifier, the transistors are in saturation. Therefore, in order to use the frequency response, you must make sure that you are applying a proper DC bias over here, maybe VDD by 2, and make sure that this is also having an appropriate DC bias. If you are using ideal uh, values and not having a very drastically different lambda and lambda p, this will not necessarily be in uh, a triad region when you are applying VDD by 2 over here. It will be somewhere close, to, somewhere between you know, uh, 0 and ground, uh, VDD and ground, but only thing you need to make sure is that uh, it is not going too low or too high when you are applying a common potential over here for the AC. So for AC response, you will connect a DC potential over here, maybe another DC potential here along with an AC potential over here and uh, sweep uh, and do the AC analysis for the output node. But while doing this, you should just make sure that the DC point over here is not too low or too high so that these transistors are entering into triode. One of these are entering into triode. For that, you can tweak the bias voltage over here a little bit so that uh, you know, this potential is not going too down or too up. So, of course, we know that these are obtained using current sources and uh, we can, in general, uh, bias both these using a single current source. But uh, just to take care of the DC bias when you are checking the frequency response, if you use same bias over here and uh, uh, um, the output of the PMOS is also being just dictated by the DC point over here, it is not necessary that you will have this in that this you know close to VDD by two. It may be low and high and pushing this one of these two transistors in triode region also. So just to make sure that it is not happening, you may be able to disconnect this and put a different DC source here at the gate of this NMOS so that you know, by tuning that you can tune the DC potential and then you can take the frequency response um, because we're expecting that the GM and um, GM and RO value will not change drastically if the currents are similar. To make sure that you are not drastically changing the current but by little bit tuning of the gate voltage you can just make sure that this is not going too low or too high. So that is one approach just for analysis sake when you are trying to do the frequency response and trying to check the open loop behavior of this circuit. Now uh, once we have uh, uh, the frequency response here of course as we said if we look at the, uh, the required gain and uh, bandwidth you have an overall gain requirement which we just estimated few hundred so around uh, 400 and uh, if we look at the uh, overall uh, bandwidth which is coming around at least uh, say a few hundreds of kilohertz to one gigahertz um, so the gain and product is pretty large and uh, from there we can look at the overall sizing of these transistors and also the choice of the stages whether we are going for single stage or two stage now if the gain bandwidth product is too large um, we know that Ultimately, bandwidth will be determined by the uh, small signal resistances and capacitances at the output nodes. This is a high frequency node which is going to uh, give you a critical pole. Another one over here which is going to give you a critical pole. This is a relatively low impedance node that does not give you a uh, significant... Uh, uh, the pole over here is at much higher frequency. So these are the critical poles. Now if I look at... Uh, uh, if I look at the output node and assume, of course, that uh, you have uh, load capacitance over here which is sufficiently larger than parasitic capacitances then the analysis will be simpler in that case I have the CL uh, times the RO over here determining the overall uh, bandwidth um, however if the parasitic capacitance over here is uh, too small uh, in that case uh, if the load capacitance over here is too small in that case this node may end up dominating so uh, we can consider both cases for the time being we can you know start with the CL of a nominal value and uh, assume this to be the dominant pole and try to look at the calculation of the W by L values. So we can take two minutes break after that we will resume the discussion.